When they say it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, it's about the size of the fight in the dog. That's true for a lot of things. Miracle sports movies, maybe your high school football team on fourth and one, going for the championship. But in the NFL, when you suck, that's kind of how it goes all season, and then into the next season, and then into the season after that. And if you're really unlucky, it can last seemingly forever, with little to no memories of ever having a sustainable culture with great players or coaches. Atlanta is a franchise with only two Super Bowl appearances and the fifth worst all-time win percentage at .438. But I think they have just the right amount of foundational pieces to be competitive this year and possibly beyond that. Now to be fair, there's a lot of question marks. I don't know who the hell will be the starting quarterback by week 7, whether it's Ritter, Heineke, or if they draft someone. I think they should go after Lamar Jackson, but I think that opportunity is long gone. Arthur Smith still has to prove himself worthy of keeping his job, and I think we'll get the answer to that by the end of the year. Questions aside, what we know right now is that the Falcons are a few years removed from the Matt Ryan and Julio Jones foundation that had been wearing away ever since their Super Bowl collapse. If you look at the timeline actually, that's really when everything went downhill. Shanahan leaves, Sarkeesian's offense is a mess, the defense gets worse, and they never found themselves again. They didn't know who they were as a defense, as an offense and as a team. The team that they have right now, I think has the potential to be better than any of those teams Matt Ryan's had. The Falcons should have one thing in mind, and that's a step towards improvement. They should be thinking about winning their division. I think this year it's possible. In fact, I ranked them in a recent post as the most likely to go from worst to first. The Saints, I think are considered to be the favorites, but it's not like they don't have questions of their own that need answering. I don't even think the NFC South overall is even that bad despite not having one team finish over 500 this past season. It'll be tough though to tell who has an edge until the end of the draft and other possible trades and transactions. For the sake of this video, I'm going to roll with Ritter being the starting guy as it was announced by Arthur Smith that he was handed the keys. During the season, Atlanta had their ups and downs but were by no means an insufferable watch. They showed a lot of promise and a commitment to the run game with multiple running backs in their quarterback. At the very least, they tried to establish an identity and they did it pretty well. Eight of their 10 losses were one possession games and their defense overall showed tremendous improvement from the year before. Connection on offense takes time and the Falcons are in good hands as they've done a really good job with drafting young talent and it's a testimony to their young GM, Terry Fontenot. Grabbing Kyle Pitts was the first step and he's someone who I think still has his best football ahead of him. Tyler Algier and Drake London are more superstars who were brought in through the draft and they're also just getting started. London and Algier have been the focal point of the offense and they'll be that for years to come. London racked up 72 catches for 866 yards and 4 touchdowns. Coming in a run heavy offense as a rookie, those are great numbers. The run game is where things get really interesting though as Algier would split a workload between Cordero Patterson but ultimately take the lead role by December, where he had a dominant stretch of games. During the month of December and January, Algier racked up 483 rush yards in five games, and if he started the season with those numbers, he would have been good for 1,642 yards. Another huge part of Atlanta's offense comes in the trenches. Chris Lindstrom was arguably the best guard in all of football last year, and Caleb McGarry and Jake Matthews continue to hold down either end of the offensive line. For the most part, we know that in football, it starts up front. Dominance on the line may not be considered as important as it was 30 years ago, but nobody in their right mind would complain if they had Philly's defensive line and offensive line. Atlanta's isn't as dominant, but it's closer than you think. I already mentioned their solid pieces on offense, but on the defensive side, the Falcons have seemingly gone into complete overhaul mode. I'm not just talking about their defensive line either, they've plugged in quality talent everywhere. Starting up front, Atlanta added these guys during free agency. Defensive tackle David Onyemata signed a three-year, $35 million deal along with defensive tackle Calais Campbell, who's still playing quality football well into his 30s. Not to mention those guys will also be paired up with the dominant Grady Jarrett, who just got a lot of help to expose more one-on-one -on -one matchups. One guy in this front seven that nobody talked about when he signed was Caden Ellis, a pass rusher who came from the division rival Saints, who had a quietly dominant season. He racked up eight sacks and was one of the highest graded pass rushers and the Falcons signed him to a three-year deal worth just $21 million. That's a steal if I've ever seen one. And they didn't just stop there. Safety Jesse Bates signed a four-year $64 million deal making him the sixth highest paid safety in NFL history. And their most recent transaction, they traded for Lions cornerback Jeff Okuda who by far had his best season last year 
which showed he's someone who doesn't waver despite two really rough seasons to start his pro career. Those guys are now paired with Pro Bowl cornerbacks AJ Terrell and Casey Hayward. Hayward has age on him, but he can still play pretty good ball. The Falcons also added some solid offensive pieces. Wide receiver Mac Hollins, who had multiple 100-yard games for the Raiders and showed his presence as a deep threat. Wide receiver Scotty Miller, who's the definition of be ready when your number's called. Offensive tackle Jermaine Orfetti, who could easily be a starter in this league, is set to be their next man up in case either tackle goes down. The Falcons are just another one of those teams that if they nail the draft, they can be a legit playoff team. There are many directions Atlanta can go. They need a linebacker, but this class isn't the strongest at that. They could use another receiver, maybe another defensive lineman to really solidify that position group. But the eighth overall pick, assuming he's on the board, I think the obvious slam dunk choice is edge rusher Tyree Wilson out of Texas Tech. Wilson comes in at a staggering 6'6", 275 pounds, which immediately gives him a size and length advantage compared to other pass rushers. Wilson has the ability to kick inside if the Falcons wish to use him that way, which why wouldn't you if you had a versatile defensive lineman? Wilson had 50 pressures this past season, so no matter where he lines up, it won't be a problem for him. And just for fun, I'm going to float the idea that Atlanta could possibly trade back into the first round, even though they may not have the desired capital to do so. We're just going to say it for fun. If they do that, I think their best shot is to get Philly at 31. And if all goes perfect and Philly decides to trade down, I would take a shot and grab wide receiver Josh Downs from North Carolina. At 5'10", 175, Downs plays a lot bigger than his size. And as a result of that, he has a tremendous ability to catch the ball in traffic. At that size, he also has great run after catch ability due to his shiftiness in open space. You can make the argument that Downs falls to them at 44, but the reason I make the suggestion of trading up is because a lot of wide receivers go early and wide receiver needy teams like Kansas City with the last pick in the first or the Rams and Titans in the early second could very well grab him before Atlanta can. Once again, this is all hypothetical. They may not even be high on Downs, this is just if I was the GM. The biggest question mark still is the quarterback position. Desmond Ritter showed flashes, but the sample size was way too small to even get the slightest idea if he's able to do that consistently. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna roll with it because I actually like Ritter a lot. He's got a better arm than people give him credit for, and he's a better athlete than people give him credit for, and I wanna show you an example of that. This play came against Tampa in the season finale, and this is just a quick glimpse that shows Ritter has what it takes to make something out of nothing which nowadays is a pretty big deal. QBs that can make off schedule throws has worked its way in almost every offense and for good reason. He's gonna avoid pressure, keep his eyes downfield, calm, cool, and collected just like that and finds his man. It's a small sample, but once again, there wasn't much to go off of his rookie year. This play against Baltimore is a good example of his feel for zones and overall just ability to be accurate. Ritter stays patient and just steps up and makes a throw where literally only the 6'5 Drake London can get it between two defenders. Pretty sick throw. I feel like the more and more you watch him, the more and more you realize, okay, we know he's a third round pick and he only started a few games last year, but there's no doubt that there's a high ceiling. No matter the uncertainties of a team, I believe one thing will always stand true. If you have an identity, if you play true to your player's strengths, you will at least be watchable and competitive. Well, I believe Atlanta has that and the talented players to go along with it. A strong run game with superhuman athletes like Drake London, Kyle Pitts, Cordero Patterson, etc. will win you some games. Jesse Bates, a Pro Bowl safety, AJ Terrell, Casey Hayward, Jeff Okuda, proven veterans with different strengths and a revamped front seven. Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot don't get enough credit for how they've built this roster after just letting go of what whatever was left of Matt Ryan and Julio Jones. Trading Calvin Ridley was tough. I know that wasn't something that they really envisioned, but it happened. But they didn't get conservative and curl up in a ball. They got aggressive. All of these new players are not only good players, but they've been there. Calais Campbell has had years of quality play, playoff experience, different systems. Jesse Bates, a playmaking machine with playoff experience. I can say the same thing for Hayward, on Yamada, Scotty Miller. Some of the names maybe don't pop out at you, but believe me, they have found great pieces to make a run for this division title and maybe more. I mean, who knows? Mid to late round QBs becoming solid and even great is just as common as them being bad and maybe awful. One thing is for sure, Desmond Ritter will have a lot of help. I think another thing worth mentioning is there's no doubt the roster is good enough. I mean, I've made that pretty clear. It's about the connection between every coach and player. Can the coaches establish plays that work and build their offense off of those handful of plays, which develop into more plays where they're using every player that they have? I want to see Patterson and Algier on the field together. Scotty Miller is a damn good receiver in space, so get him the ball. Matt Collins, Kyle Pitts, Drake London, three big ass targets who are clearly good enough 
to get nine plus targets a game. The players are there. The promise is there. Atlanta wants that swag back, that Jerry Glanville, Dirty Bird, Deion Sanders swag back. Ever since 2017, there's been an itch that they just can't scratch and it's unfinished business. They're a team that isn't being talked about as much as they should be because if they start clicking, it's gonna get dangerous. All I know is come December, I think there's gonna be a new alpha bird in the NFC, a long-awaited comeback that'll make the whole city of Atlanta once again rise up.